Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fishing with Ashley. In today's episode, we're visiting some of Empire Genomics' most frequently asked questions. We'll cover topics like probe storage, sample processing, scope management, and much more. So without further ado, let's jump into the webinar. So the first frequently asked question that I get is storage requirements. What temperature should I store these probes in? When should I throw them out? Should they be in the dark, et cetera? So we recommend that you store the Empire Genomics probes at negative 20 degrees Celsius. You wanna avoid light as Empire Genomics probes as well as most fluorescent probes are light sensitive and can photo bleach. So you should not be exposing these probes to excessive light. And then the expiration date is always gonna be noted on the product label and you can see that in the image and it's on the probe. Once it reaches expiration, you don't need to rinse out the probe down the sink or anything special. Just throw them in the trash with whatever is left in the vial. Uh, a lot of people think they need to rinse it out in the sink, and this is actually not recommended. Just throw it directly in your normal trash can. So the next question I get often is, my probe arrived to the lab yesterday and has been at room temperature for over 24 hours before I was able to open it and place it in the freezer. Will it still work? Now, sometimes it's not yesterday. Sometimes I get questions like, it arrived over the weekend and nobody was there, or I was on vacation and it's been a couple days. Um, sometimes when the probes get sent to Europe, they take more than 24 hours to arrive and they're at room temperature for a little bit longer. Is the probe still going to work? Well, the answer is yes. Empire Genomics has done stability studies that show our probes remain stable over the course of weeks when left at room temperature and shielded from light of course, you want to make sure that these probes were still in the package and shielded from light, or if you've already opened the probe and you left it out overnight after using it, if this probe was in a dark environment, it sh still should be perfectly good to use. So, of course, it is ideal to open the package immediately and store the probe or probes in the dark at negative 20 degrees Celsius as soon as possible. But like I said, if the probe was left out for a few days or up to weeks, it should still work as long as it was shielded from light so that it doesn't photo bleach and cause issues with the probes. So I get a lot of questions about working with FFP, one of which is what is the recommended thickness of FFPE tissue sections for performing fish? So it is recommended that FFP tissue sections be cut around three to five micrometers and placed on a positively charged slide to allow for optimal fish testing. If the tissue is cut too thick or greater than five micrometers, it can be difficult to interpret signals as the cells may overlap. Digestion is also gonna be really difficult with these thicker cuts of tissue, and that's gonna result in poor hybridization and poor signal. If the tissue cuts are too small or are less than three micrometers, this can lead to signal truncation or basically just a lack of signals. So another question I get often is in FFPE samples, what is the purpose of pepsin and how long should I digest with pepsin? So pepsin and the digestion step of FFPE processing is by far the biggest issue I see in labs. A lot of labs have difficulty troubleshooting this step and trying to figure out how long they should be digesting with pepsin. So I've put together a little spiel here about what pepsin does. And I've put together a chart with some more common tissue types that are digested for fish and the times that you should approximately digest them at. So pepsin is used to break down excess cytoplasmic proteins in the sample to allow for the probe to enter the cell. Proteins are unwanted in samples because it can keep the probe from entering the nucleus and it can create autofluorescence and obscure probe signals. And the goal of digestion is to remove enough proteins to allow for the probe into the nucleus, but not so much proteins that the cell architecture is lost. So I've also put together this chart here to the right. We've got lung, breast, kidney, ovary, colon, and brain tissue, and an approximate digestion time for each of those. Now, it's important to note that this is all approximate, and depending on the lab and your pepsin concentration, you're going to have to troubleshoot this but it's a good little guideline for where to start with your digestion for these tissue types. So the next question is in FFPE samples, what's the best way to check if the sample is properly digested? 
So I get this question very often. How should I check if the, the sample has been digested enough? How do I look to see if it's been overly digested? So the best way to do so is viewing the slides under a phase scope after digesting to determine if you need more time in digestion. So you wanna start at a baseline of what that chart kind of said or around 20 minutes. And then you're going to take the slide out of the digestion, the pepsin solution. You're gonna wet the slide in 70% alcohol, dry the back of the slide so that it moves easily on the scope stage, and then place the slide on the scope. So when you're viewing the cells wet with the alcohol, it's gonna make for easier viewing of the digestion. So this is a little trick I've learned over the years. So you wanna be able to see clear, dark, intact nuclei as well as intact cell membranes. If you see any material covering the nuclei, you may wanna digest longer. If you see broken cell membranes and nuclei with holes, you may have digested too long. I've also included these four images here. This is after fish testing has been done and you're viewing on your fluorescent microscope. The first two images indicate under digestion and you can see autofluorescence, you see unclear cell membranes and weak signal. In the second image here, you see a lot of tissue remnants and weak or no signal throughout the cells. And these are images that are very indicative of under digestion. So if you're seeing something similar to this with your FFPE fish results, you may wanna to try to digest your tissue a little bit longer. Looking at the other two images to the right here, these are indicative of overdigestion, and you see ghost nuclei, you see donut-like holes in the center of the cells, very little to no probe signal, and then you can just see the cells kind of look like they're eaten away in the second image or the one to the furthest right. They just don't look clean, crisp, and clear, and you can see holes in them. And this is very indicative of overdigestion, and that can lead to no signal. So if this is what you're seeing with your FFPE results, you may wanna lower your digestion time. So moving on to conditions for dropping cell pellets. A big question that I get is, do I need specific conditions to drop peripheral blood and bone marrow cell pellets? And the answer is depending on the type of cells that you're trying to fish. So if you're looking at conducting interphase cell fish testing on cell pellets, you do not need special environmental conditions. You can just drop at the bench level. So when I say environmental conditions, I mean alterations of humidity and temperature. So with interface cell fish, you wanna see about 50 cells per field of view. If the cell concentration is too high, the cells may overlap, which is gonna make it very difficult to distinguish cell membranes, and it's going to lead to poor overlapping signals. If you're dropping cell pellets and are looking for metaphase fish testing, you do need special environmental conditions to obtain well-spread metaphases with no cytoplasm around the metaphases. So I recommend using a thermotron for this as it's the best option for dropping metaphases. It controls the temperature and humidity very well. The optimal temperature is usually around 24 to 26 degrees Celsius, and the optimal humidity is usually around 48 to 55% humidity. Now this is gonna vary from lab to lab depending on the lab environment, and it's something that you're gonna need to troubleshoot a little bit in your lab to make sure that you're getting really good metaphase spreads. So I've included three images of metaphase spreads up on top here. The first one is poorly spread. You can see that there's cytoplasm around the chromosomes and the chromosomes are not well separated. So the cytoplasm is definitely causing some hindered probe signals. So that's very problematic if you're looking at metaphase fish. Looking at the image in the middle, this used fresh fixative and slowed the drying time a little bit by increasing humidity and lowering the temperature. It helped to eliminate the cytoplasm and help those chromosomes spread really well, leading to great probe signal. And the last picture here, while this is not as common, it's important to know that a metaphase can be overspread and you can lose chromosomes if the metaphase overspreads. You'll see this the chromosomes will look very far apart and sometimes you may have a few straggler chromosomes kind of further away from your metaphase and this is going to be problematic when you're going to analyze because if you lose a chromosome that you're targeting you're going to see no signal so moving on to baking of slides one question i get a lot is should i bake my blood and bone marrow cell pellet slides after dropping them and before applying probe so this is a pretty controversial um, topic to talk about. 
Some people do bake, some people don't bake, some people bake for a really long time, but the correct answer is you do not need to bake or age your cell pellet slides prior to fish testing. This is an older protocol and it's not necessary to obtain great fish signal. In general, prolonged baking or aging of slides prior to fish creates weak fish signals as it can dry out the chromatin. However, if you do wish to bake or your protocol already calls for a bake and that's just what your techs are used to, do so at a short high temperature. The short high temperature bakes prior to fish have been shown to condense chromatin and condense scattered signals. So if you're seeing a scattered probe signal, a short hot bake might be beneficial for your protocol. So if you do bake, keep it short and hot, Keep it between 90 and 95 degrees Celsius for about five to 10 minutes, and that is plenty of time. So we're gonna look at probe to buffer ratio now, and I have three images off to the left with different ratios of probe to buffer. And a question I get often is, what is the probe to buffer ratio I should use? And is it safe to use more or less probe if I want to? So the top image there utilize a protocol with one microliter of probe and nine microliters of buffer. And you can see that there's not a great signal throughout and signals very weak. So this is pretty indicative of what's gonna happen if you try to save money and use less probe. I have had labs, they were just trying to get more tests out of the tube or the vial of probe and they used one microliter for their testing and they're getting poor signal. And the reason is that they're not using enough probe. The middle image there utilized a protocol with double the amount of probe and six microliters of buffer. So you can see that there's a lot of background within and outside of the cell, which is very problematic for analyzing. And it's also come, becomes a question of, am I seeing cross hive or am I seeing background? It can be very confusing for technologists. So using more probe can be dangerous in that it's gonna make background within and outside of the cell that's gonna make it very difficult to analyze. A lot of labs think that using extra probes just gonna make the signal brighter. Maybe they're seeing weak signal and they wanna double up the probes to make the signal brighter. But I always like to say, if you're using the right processing protocol and you're processing your cells properly, you should never have to use extra probe to brighten the signals. Finally, the image on the bottom utilized the proper protocol with the recommended two microliters of probe mixed with eight microliters of buffer. And as you can see, you have really bright, beautiful signals in all of the cells and in that metaphase. So denaturation temperature. Can I use a denaturation temperature that's different than that of Empire Genomics Protocol? So a lot of labs actually like to kind of bump up or bump down the denaturation temperature. They think it's going to really alter their signal. If they bump it up, they might get better, stronger signal. They think it's gonna incorporate the probe into the DNA more. And that isn't always the case. So just use caution when you stray from the, the protocol and the denaturation protocol. If you bump the denaturation up at too high of a temperature or for too long, you'll see what is seen in this first image here, which could be a hazy green background or whatever color your probe is background and like sort of a firework like probe coloring throughout the cells, which is just gonna obscure all of your signals and result in very poor analyzing. And looking at the second image, the one to the right, if you're denaturing at too low of a temperature, you may not be incorporating all of that probe into the DNA and you're going to get weak probe signals. So another common question I get is, am I seeing cross hybridization or background on my slides? How can I tell the difference? So for me, cross hybridization is very indicative when I can count extra probes in cells so for instance, in these cells, there's three cells here. And in two of these cells, I clearly see two extra green signals along with the break apart signals. So to me, that's clearly cross hybridization. There's two extra signals in this cell, two extra signals in this cell. There's virtually no background outside of the cell anywhere else. This third cell off to the left here, you can see two slight greens. Um, the camera might not have picked up those signals as well but that to me is very indicative of cross hybridization. So again, the top image shows clearly defined extra signals in multiple cells, and I've circled those in red, and there's very little or no fluorescence outside of the cell. Now, as for the bottom image, you can see fluorescence within and outside of the cells. 
while some spots within the cell look like extra signal, it is much more likely that this lab has seen background issues here. You can use higher stringency washes or more vigorous wash to help get rid of that unbound probe. Or if you're using too much probe, you want to back it down to the recommended amount of two microliters. Um, you don't see clear extra signals in these cells. In this middle cell, this might look like an extra red signal, but I don't see any extra red signals in any other cells. So because of that, to me, this is a background issue and not a cross hybridization issue. So let's talk about scopes. Are my scope filters and bulb causing my background slash poor signal issues? So depending on the manufacturer's recommendations, fluorescent filters typically need to be replaced every two to four years. Over time and use, the filter will begin to degrade and you may notice a higher than normal background or weak probe signals. So it's very important to talk to your scope technologists or providers and get an idea of who's providing your filters and when these filters need to be replaced because they can cause issues for you when it comes to analyzing and taking images. Another thing to keep track of is your bulb. Depending on the type of bulb you are using, the shelf life can vary from 200 to 3,000 hours. So it's important to verify with your supplier the life of your particular bulb as the older the bulb becomes, the dimmer the fluorescent signals can become. Now, something else I want to mention that's not on this slide is a few labs have had problems with their fiber optic cord that is a part of the fluorescent microscope. So it's also important to note when fiber optic cords for your type of scope need to be replaced as this can cause poor signal issues. So finally, the last question I get here is, can I store previously fished slides? And the answer to this is, of course you can. But what is recommended is that once you fish the slide and apply the DAPI with antifade, you cover slip the slide and ensure there are no bubbles beneath the cover slip. And a big note here is make sure that there's antifade because if you want long-term storage and you want to look at these signals again in the future, antifade is going to be key here. And making sure there's no bubbles beneath the cover slip is going to ensure that nothing's going to dry out on those cells. So it's recommended that you seal the cover slip with a varnish to keep the probe and counter stain from drying out. And then for long-term storage, just make sure all the slides are shielded from any light so there's no photo bleaching and place it in a fridge at two to eight degrees Celsius. 